I, I, okay, good. I can't hear myself, but that's okay. Uh, I'm the designer of all the XPIM products that are on the market. Um, I've been doing this since I started off doing pin score designs back in 2008, and then I broke off in 2010, 2011 to start focusing on XPIN, my own brand, brand name. Um, a little bit about me, I've been uh, doing electronics professionally uh, for about the last 35 years, and it's been an exciting ride as far as all the changes in technology that are out there. Um, there's challenges. One of the things I often joked about early on is that, you know, electronics with pinball, it's, all, it's almost a forensic engineering, trying to figure out what is going on in the game itself. The circuit boards, the schematics, okay, great, thanks. Schematics, uh, because how many of you have ever looked at the schematics from these pinball machines? How many of you found that they're actually what they represent in the pinball machines? I can, <laughs> it's a rough go because sometimes the schematics do not match what is going on in the game itself or how they're hooked up. I have found missing wires that were never documented in, in the manuals. I have found rerouting is going on. I've found boards that no one even knew existed. They were in the, in the prototype phases, you know, so. It's, it was it was fascinating. It's been it's one of those things that, for me as an engineer, and that is exactly it. I'm a professional engineer, uh, and been doing a variety of technologies for this time in my career. But I've always come back to the pinball electronics because it is fascinating. It's fun. It's what drives me to do this. Now, I can spend hours talking about how difficult it is to troubleshoot between old technology. And when I say old technology, I'm talking 1977 classic Bally games, some of their boards, and, and having it made up to technology from 1920, in, in now in the 21st century. And that's one of the reasons I came up with the logo I did was Evolution Evolved, because we are taking steps forward and making things happen that normally couldn't happen. And so, I'm going to focus really on first one part of this. Uh, one of the things that I get the most tech calls on, support calls, ask me, what is it that's going on here? Why is it doing this? And there's a fundamental reason in the designs from, pre from 30 years ago to what there is now, what we can do with it now. And so I'll focus on that. And then when I wrap up, I'll also lead into some of the other things that I am doing to try to make sure that I am mating up to the technologies because there's a lot of parts that are no longer manufactured, mating up the technologies, and what I'm doing to make sure that they, the boards that I'm producing, you can utilize, use to troubleshoot your games to help you fix them and maintain them. To me, that's what it is, keeping the game alive, making sure that it runs and runs for a long period of time. So, I'm going to focus on displays because displays are what I do, have done. I started with 15 years ago, and I still am working on, and still evolving. And that, looking at the original displays, we're talking the technology was gas plasmas. We had the gas plasmas in the Bally, classic Bally's. We had the gas plasmas in the classic Williams. We had plasmas in dot matrix in the 90s. We had Futaba tubes in Gottlieb games. I mean, we, Atari was the only one really that went down the path of LEDs at that time. We started looking at those. But a couple of things about it, if you think about it, what we, the world we live in today, your Williams games, they required plus and minus 90 volts to light up those, those, so, those scores, those segments. Valley games, they were looking at 200 volts. Your Gottliebs, they needed 60 volts and 42 volts for their Futabas. Um, technologies that we, we no longer can get, the 6118s, the, six, uh, the 7180s, they stopped manufacturing the high voltage versions of those back in the 90s. So if you see, if someone says, I've got brand new ones, always raise the hand and say, wait a minute, who'd you get them from? And they'll probably say, well, we had take, took them off some boards, they're new to us. I ran into that. Uh, uh, so. 
you have to be looking at that. Now we look at dot matrix displays from the 90s. They needed minus 100. They needed minus 110. They needed plus 65, some outrageous voltages that we have to deal with. Uh, and then not just that, on the devices, on those dot matrix displays, because dot matrix is a big thing right now, because they stopped manufacturing the gla glass plasma dot matrix to displays. For the ICs, that they were used predominantly on the back of those boards to make them run, they stopped manufacturing them when they stopped manufacturing the dot matrix display. So why is this important? Because we're talking LED technology now, five volts. I got huge voltages here, got to deal with five volts. But voltage aside, there's a signaling aspect, communicating back and forth through the technologies to get the displays and functioning correctly. Some people may think it's easier than it is, but you have to be careful of what you're dealing with. So I pulled this out. This is a typical Williams display circuit matchup. Easy enough, you can see this. On the left-hand side, this is what this, the MPU is putting out to the display, something very simple. You got that beautiful 6821 that also is not manufactured anymore, but you could get them for 75 cents on Alibaba. Um, and so you have that old technology feeding in. We're going through some stand, a little SIP resistor in that work, RC network, going out to the display. Great. That's what I have to deal with. I look at what's there. And then I look at the J1, which is J1 on one of the, on a, the original displays. And you have this list of inverters in the CD, Ford, CD series of devices. There are so many product families out there as far as technologies goes. You have the CD, you have your TTL, you have your LS, you have your HC, HCTT, you have AC, you have numerous others, LS devices. But they're logic, it's digital, it's circuitry. But there's something interesting about going on with these things. Now on the 6821, when it drives the signal to the display, it's, it's driving, driving it out, it's an OC display, so it's open collector. Now, for those of you who are, you know, in the electronics industry, it's, it's simply this. If they're driving a transistor, when it's a zero, when you want a zero logic level out, it's going to be, it's going to be ground, zero. When you want a one on the output, it's high impedance, very high resistance, and so you have to put a resistor there to pull it up to five volts, if that's the case. Great, straightforward, kind of standard TTL, not a big deal. But then you look at the other side. The other side is a CD device and a 4050 device, and this is on the original boards. This is before you get to the 6118s and the 7180s. You have a uh, 4050 device where zero is no longer zero volts. Zero is now anything from 1.5 volts down to zero. That's a zero. And as far as, the, as one goes, it has to be greater than four volts. Why is this important? Because in a standard, most standard di uh, digital logic devices, your low is 0 0.8 volts or less, not 1.5. 1.5 is in that metastable area. You don't know what you're going to get, depending on the devices. And a high, depending on the device, has to be a minimum of 2.2 volts before it can be considered a high. So you get this gray area that's going on here. How can you guarantee to make sure that you're going to respond to it the way you need to? That's some of the challenges associated with dealing with electronics right now, especially with, the, with all the aftermarket stuff going on. I'm not the only one making displays. I don't talk bad about the other players. I, competitive intelligence-wise, yeah, go out and buy their products and take a look to see what they're doing and seeing if I'm better or worse. They do their designs. They have their reasons for doing the choices they do. I have the reasons I do mine. Uh, nothing said. There's more than one way to accomplish the same task. But it's good to know how other people are thinking and looking and evaluating things. So what I did in com to combat this, uh, com 
to for solu solving this and making it easier because I ended up with a, some great features. I get some great features on this. Is that I, I created my I started looking at it and how I can make things happen better for everybody. Came up with a simple solution and it works. It's I need a ground, but I can't count on ground coming from the CPU, MPU board, so I made sure I had a low zero value. So I put pull down resistors. That's basically from the signal going to ground. So when I needed a zero, it was gonna be a zero. If, if the system was putting out 1.5 volts, I'd still come down to zero for me. The logic chip would use to see that. Now I use standard LS devices, low power shot key. Again, it's also about power. It goes and talks about power. We, one of the design, basic design guidelines I've always had for the years I've been doing this is that I don't want to add anything into the system that doesn't already exist. <clears throat> if I have a five volt supply, Williams Games, you had a three amp voltage regulator for five volt rail in those early games. I wanted to make sure that my displays could operate in that five volt rail without causing a reset. So I've designed it to make sure it's always operating lower power than what was required. And electrical engineers, they have means to go ahead and calculate the power budget and figure out how much power they need for any given display so, or product. So that's how they keep things in, in control. So that's why I chose the low power shock key devices. And because of the design, I, I ended up with a great little feature that allows me to turn on all of the segments without having the MPU involved to test it. When the biggest calls, one of the most standard calls I get is that they, they will say that they have replaced their display because they have some missing segments. And then they put their display in, then they say it's outgassing or something's happened with the plasma tube. And I said, well, are you still missing the segments? Well, yeah, I'm still missing the segments. What's the deal? That's just tubes. What, what else is going on? I said, push the test button. I gave them a test button. Push the test button. All the segments come on. And when they say, well, heck, that means the display is working. So now the next step is start figuring out what isn't working. But at least you have confidence that the display is working. If a segment's needing to be on, it's going to be on the way it's supposed to be. So not going to happen there. And then on top of that, I, I have this, and this is just a cutout from a graphic, but you're starting to see these more on my boards where I have a test and a play jumper selection. Okay, What that does is that with that test, if you put the jumper on the test, you can hook up you can disconnect everything except your displays and the power. Push the test button and it'll come on. That means that that will tell you that you are 100% isolated from the MPU system and you know that that display is functional. And that's what, that's what people are enjoying about this is that, okay, taking the step. This is part of the technology interface and bringing things out because when something has failed in your game, what is it that's happening? Say, I've got to replace something. I've got to fix something. Well, I don't know about you. When I got my first pinball machine, yeah, I'm an electrical engineer, but my first pinball machine, heck, it was missing. It had wires all over the place. And that it, was, it had been started to be parted out by the local coin op for miscellaneous parts. It's like, oh my gosh, what is this wire going to and why is it soldered like this? Not in the harness. So me, I was able to do that, but from a lot of the new people to the hobby that are looking at getting these games to play and enjoy a little bit of nostalgia, they don't have the background I do, but they still would like to work on their games. This is a great step to start that. If you have your display and you know your display is working, but you're getting some garbage, maybe, at least you can start looking for the garbage. And that's why it is, in this particular case, you can remove that ribbon cable from the MP, you know, connecting you to the MPU. You can remove everything 
And so you know the problem's further upstream. It's a great starting point. So as I said, also, when, you, when I push the test button, yes, all segments are functional. I have matched an interface, successfully interfaced between old technology and new technology. Uh, I've verified that all my LED blocks are functional and they're good. And if there are still display issues, you go upstream. You kind of find, figure out where it's at. 140, the 74154, guess what? That is a bugger of a device to figure out and now to replace because there is only one manufacturer, sorry about that guys, there's only one manufacturer in the world currently making a pin, uh, dip socket or a dip package for the 154. So we have some other developers that have gone through and taken the surface mount, put it on a dip package so that you can still carry that out because that is such a common failure in these games. That 154 is used in Williams, all the 80s Williams games. It's used in some of the, it's used in the Valley Midway games. There, so it was well used. It's one of those components that, you know, it's like, okay. It is what it is. We understand it. So that's one of the challenges associated with interfacing technology. Because technology is changing. It's constantly changing. Uh, when you think about what you got to do, you got to see how it is, and you basically go and talk to the people to find out. Me personally, I love talking to you guys. I love getting the phone call saying, hey, I got a problem. Can you help me with this? And yes, they'll buy my board, great, but now they call me back and say, hey, I put your board in, it looks great, it's working great, but I'm still missing a segment. Or hey, how come I'm still popping this fuse? Or something else is happening. Why is this, this, why is this solenoid still locked on but I'm not smoking it? And everything else. So there's a variety of things that can be done. Now, on my side, I'm still on doing a lot more stuff. As I said, a little bit more about me just to summarize because they, Rob only gave me a half hour. That's okay. I've been very busy downstairs. But compatibility for me has always been a driving factor. I will test it in as many games as I can. I will never say I did something, I, it was perfect. I've been doing this for long enough that, let me tell you, I constantly get surprises from people that are saying, this is going on in their game, what can I do about it? And then when you talk about it, it's like, I've never heard of that, I want to look into this. This is exciting. This is what keeps me going back into the development. You can always count on me for one thing, that testability and troubleshooting are features that I value. I've been in your position. I've been trying to troubleshoot a game. I was, dang, I wish I did do that. I have my, my driver boards that I'm coming out with right now. I'm putting buttons on the solenoid drivers so that you can push the button and fire a solenoid without having to go in and search through a menu in a uh, <clears throat> in very obscure diagnostic features. It was one of those things that PinWiki and they say you can test your solenoids. Get a set of alligator clips, clip it to ground, touch the tab to the transistor with the other end, and you'll fire that solenoid. No, I'm not big on alligator clips. I'd rather just push the button. And you'll start, you'll be seeing that in a lot of my designs now coming through that way to keep it simple. LEDs, great indicators. LEDs under fuses are wonderful. People love that because if the LED is lit, obviously you got power. But if it's not lit, you immediately know you got a fuse problem, something happened. Some place to go start looking at say what it is about it. And just a typical plug, do not overfuse games. It causes more nightmares than you can believe. I spend a lot of time guiding, getting guidance and information out of PinWiki from people who have gone through a troubleshoot. And so I will add features based around their troubleshooting techniques and verification. So you're seeing that a lot in my products. And I can only say, stop by my booth. 
talk to me. I'm, I've been adding boards. You know, Rob has been great, and he's lent me some games, and I'm putting boards in his games that have the, a lot of these features so I can demonstrate and show you how these features work to make your life better and easier in supporting your games. This is, this is what pinball is about. It's about gameplay. It's about what you're passionate about. Me, I'm passionate more about the engineering. I don't have a big pinball collection. I only have seven pinball machines. Want more, wife says no. But that doesn't stop me. I have, I cycle games through all the time because I've solved it. I don't design a board unless I have a game for it to go into. And that's where it's at. So, Brandon, my time is out. Is there any questions that I can answer or for you right now? Or I can actually go down, uh, you can meet me downstairs in my booth. I'm back by the concession stand and where they're serving beer. I'd probably say, if you want to get into technical discussions, have a few drinks before you start talking to me. Because we'll have a great, lively conversation. So, but that's it. I'm glad I'm here. Have fun at the show. This is an awesome place. I've been gone for five years. I'm back, and I'm going to be here again next year. So, thank you. Thank you.